Hello and welcome to the Street Crime UK YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more content. Today we look at one of the most ruthless killers to ever exist in the UK prison system. A man whose name was used to take out fellow inmates who owed debts and a man who came to the UK and killed an innocent member of the public in a botched robbery revenge job. So who was Victor Castigador? Victor Castigador was an illegal immigrant when he moved from the Philippines to Britain in 1985. But way before any of this, going back to his childhood, Victor was raised in Quezon City, a place that was surrounded by active volcanoes, and was a place that was notoriously known as the Ring of Fire. The Philippines was also prone to earthquakes and typhoons, and because of all this, Mr. Castigador had grown up in a very impoverished area. The Philippines has been fought over by countless invaders over the last hundred years, from the Spanish to the Americans to the Japanese. And although the Treaty of Manila saw this newly independent country become a democracy, like so many others that were in it, the country soon slid into a dictatorship. Being a small and scrawny lad as a youngster, Mr. Castigador was bullied a lot by older children, in a way to assert their dominance over him. In response to all the bullying, he worked out a lot, and what he lacked in height, he made sure that he made up in for his strength. By the age of 21, Mr. Castigador had applied for the army and for the secret police, but was denied both positions due to his height. The height requirement in the 1970s was 5 foot 4 for the army and 5 foot 2 for the police. Due to his lack of skill and being partially deaf because of a childhood infection, it is most likely that he started off as a security guard. Mr. Castigador repeatedly lied about joining the army, the police and a quasi-military death squad, and this was only the beginning of his lies. He had only worked as a diver and also lacked the basic literacy skills for an administrative role. It was more than likely that the only role that he was able to get that he could have been labelled as as a career in uniform was a security guard. When it came to his love life, Mr. Castigador had met Jacqueline Haddon while she was still involved in a seven year marriage. They had an affair and quickly fell in love. The couple travelled to England in 1984 and lived in a coastal village in Middleton-on-Sea where they later had their son in October of 1984. They got married in August 1985 and in October of 1986 their daughter Robin was conceived. Unfortunately, Victor ended up abusing his wife and mistreated his children and so his wife told him to leave and later filed for divorce. With him now being alone, as a UK citizen with a passport and a legal right to remain, by the winter of 1986 Victor had moved into a relative's flat at Coventry Cross, a council estate in Bow, East London. Being too small for a career in the British military or the police, he headed to the West End in search of a job. Eventually, he came across the amusement arcade at 23 Gerrard Street, open from midday to midnight, Monday to Sunday, with a strict over 18s only policy. The arcade consisted of two ground floor rooms filled with 30 pinball machines, penny drop machines, computer games and slot machines. The duty manager was a 24-year-old Yurev Alejandro Gomez from Chile, who was nicknamed Yuri to those who worked there. He was the one that ended up hiring Victor, giving him his job. Victor was one of the three security guards who worked in shifts, with two on duty always. It was a simple job with regular hours, nice staff and a decent wage. You couldn't really complain about someone that didn't have much work experience. The day started from 12pm and finished at 12am. When it was time to close, one security guard would watch over the floor whilst the ever would escort the duty manager and the receptionist down to the basement. Behind a thick steel door stood the strong room, a reinforced concrete hold with no windows. Inside the strong room, there was a 6 foot square wire cage, where the takings were stored in a safe until the morning. The only one that had the key to unlock it was Yuri. The basement was also used as a storeroom and stacked with cleaning products, newspapers and paints for general purposes and repairs. By 12.30am the doors would be locked, the lights off and the alarm set, and then finally everyone would be ready to go home. The cleaners would start at 8am, but the staff would not come in until 12pm and would start the day again. For Victor, every day he resided in a small room with one of the other two security guards for 12 hours stuck seeing the same sights, the same familiar faces whilst executing the same routine. He 
He had been working on the Amusement Arcade as a security guard, but after working there for three years, he asked for a position as a deputy manager. But his low literacy skills and short temper made him unfit for the job. When they denied his request for a promotion, Victor started to retaliate by being lazy and unreliable, causing a fuss for everyone else who worked around him. He was relieved of his position as security guard, and instead of moving on and finding a new job, that was not enough for Mr. Castigador, and it was now that his plan was made to rob the arcade. Mr. Castigador, followed by his four other accomplices, 17-year-old Calvin Graham Nelson, 19-year-old Paul Stephen Clinton, and their girlfriends, 17-year-old Karen Dunn, and 20-year-old Alison Linda Woodside, were to rob the arcade of all its cash. They broke into the arcade late at night on August 2nd, 1989. The relief manager, Yuri, and the cashier, Debbie, were closing everything, and counting the money when the five figures came rushing into the arcade and pointed guns in their direction. Mr. Castigador knocked out the first security guard. The staff had already been made aware to not resist in the case of a robbery due to all the money already being insured, in an event that such thing would happen. The staff stayed quiet and calm, following all instructions and paid close attention to everything that was happening in the situation. It didn't take much for them to identify the ringleader of the operation as Mr. Castigador. This was due to his short and stocky frame and thick Filipino accent. As soon as Yuri had led the gang of thugs into the storeroom where they kept the money, Mr. Castigador whacked him in the head across the head, knocking him down to the floor. Together, the gang were able to obtain around £9,000, but alone that wasn't enough for Mr. Castigador, as he had a deep-rooted problem with the arcade's manager. Three out of the four accomplices decided to leave the scene, which now left Victor Castigador and Paul Clinton to deal with the victims. Mr. Castigador decided that he would force his ex-colleagues onto their knees and tie up the two Sri Lankan security guards. As well as Yuri and Debbie, they were all restrained in the inner cage of the security vault before Mr. Castigador doused them in wise spirit and tossed a lit match and locked the door behind him. They all cried out for mercy, but it fell on deaf ears. Yuri had pleaded that he'd rather he'd be shot to death than dealing with the slow and painful death of being burned alive but the guns that Victor had brought were all but real. To make sure that they had no chance of escaping or surviving, Mr. Castigador used a metal coat hanger to lock the steel door of the strong room. The two security guards unfortunately died from third degree burns and asphyxiation. Eventually, Yuri had managed to break free from his restriction and tried to kick the door with his rubber soled shoes as the cage was too hot to touch. He kicked it, but it was to no avail, and Yuri and Debbie were able to survive only by pitting out the fire and rolling around and breathing air through the keyhole of the door and a very thin gap underneath the steel door. It was only when the cleaners arrived in the morning at 7.55am that they were able to be saved and released from the cage. After calling 999, it did not take long for the Shaftesbury Avenue Station Police to arrive at the scene and to take control of the whole situation. As the detectives reached the basement, the whole area was charred black, making it hard to identify much. But one thing that did stand out was the smell of burnt flesh emanating around the room. Luckily, Yuri and Debbie were alive, but they were in critical condition. They were excessively lucky to be able to survive the whole night. While the victims were stuck trying to fend for themselves, Mr. Castigador and Mr. Clinton had decided to celebrate the success of the robbery with a meal going out clubbing and then taking a trip to Torquay, which is a seaside resort town in Devon, southwest of England. As an inside joke, they had amused their taxi driver with their own rendition of the Beats Master song, Burn It Up. All five were arrested a few days later in Torquay and in a joint operation between the Devon and Met Police. They were escorted back to Cannon Row Police Station on the April 14th, 1989. Mr. Castigador was charged with one count of robbery, two counts of murder, and two counts of attempted murder. Calvin Nelson and Paul Clinton were convicted of robbery, murder, and attempted murder. On April the 14th, 1989, Mr. Castigador was charged with one count of robbery, two counts of murder, and two counts of attempted murder. Calvin Nelson and Paul Clinton were convicted of robbery, murder, and attempted murder with Calvin being sent to a Young Offenders Institute for life. Paul was held in detention under Her Majesty's pleasure and Karen Dunn and Alison Woodside were found guilty of robbery. Despite Yuri having suffered from 30% burns on his arms and chest, as well as losing a lung due to the inhalation of toxic fumes, 
and Debbie with 28% burns on her arms, hands, backs, thighs and lungs. They were able to testify on February 28th, 1990. All five culprits were found guilty. To truly comprehend how vicious the whole ordeal was, James McCulley, the Mr. Castigador's own defence barrister, said to the jury during the trial that it would be very surprising had you not come to the conclusion that Mr. Castigador was a ruthless, callous and inhumane monster. The judge, Mr. Justice Ruggier, concluded that I find it almost impossible to understand a mind as evil as yours and sentenced him to life in prison. To which Mr. Castigador smiled, looked at the judge and said, Fair enough. There were in fact several things that went wrong with Mr. Castigador's plan to rob the arcade. The disguises that the gang had chosen to wear were far from impressive or appropriate for such a job. Mr. Castigador wore an oversized hood, a slipping scarf, and no gloves to cover up his fingerprints. If the whole operation wasn't bad enough, Mr. Castigador decided to do the operation with a toy gun rather than a real one, which might have gone in his favour if he had just taken the cash and left. Despite them gaining so much money, the gang didn't think to collect the money from the slot machines, and they didn't take into consideration the CCTV, which had recorded everything that had happened. It was very ill-planned, and all the sloppiness that took place had contributed to the detectives being able to figure out who was involved quickly and track them down. What makes it worse is that he also involved four youths who were about half his age to be involved in a robbery, and in doing so essentially ruined their lives at such a young age. The only thing that actually was done right by Mr. Castigador was the execution of actually obtaining the cash, and this was only down to the fact that he knew the ins and outs of the arcade. So he knew exactly what he needed to do to get the money. It is just very unfortunate that his grudge against the arcade and his ego couldn't stop with just robbing the money. Mr. Castigador had to take it one step further and went out of his way to endanger and take the lives of the very same people that he not so long ago used to refer to as work colleagues. Five years ago, Victor Castigador brutally murdered another inmate and convicted child killer, Sidonio Tixira, with a rock. He claimed to the judge that it was now his job to punish evil. At the age of 61, Mr. Castigador had wrapped a stone, one that he had got from a fish tank, inside a sock and had thrown many strong blows at such a velocity that the victim, Mr. Texida, later died as a result of these injuries on the way to the hospital. The judge heard how it was a premeditated attack that took place at around 9am on June the 20th. Mr. Tixida was currently serving a life sentence himself for the murder of his three-year-old daughter, as well as his attempted murder of his nine-year-old son. Mr. Castigador had declared him a horrible man and a bully, and stated that if his victim had somehow survived, that he would have done whatever it took to kill him again. It was surprising how Mr. Castigador had reacted considering the way that he treated his own children and wife before his own incarceration. Even though Mr. Castigador was already serving a life sentence for the incident in 1989, he was handed another whole life jail term at Birmingham Crown Court on October 21st, 2016. According to the barrister, Mr. Castigador had a history of violence against other prisoners. He stabbed an inmate in the eye in 2006 and another in 2011. Mr. Castigador has even been recognised as a very established prison hitman by Yami B and Quincy Thwaites, who discussed doing time with Mr. Castigador and how he was a man who had many, many accomplished hits under his belt. According to the report, at 4.59pm on March 18th, 2017, Mr. Castigador was found slumped, with his right side shaking in an erratic manner. He was breathing, however there was a white frothy liquid spilling from his mouth, and he had also been very sick. The officers put him into a recovery position and called out a code blue across the radio channel, which was code for when an inmate is unconscious and not breathing. According to records, Mr. Castigador had a high pulse of 104 beats per minute, but a normal blood pressure of 107 over 86. He had no verbal response to officers, however he would open his eyes to express verbal stimuli. Regardless of his crimes, at no time was Mr. Castigador mistreated whilst being taken care of by medical professionals. An ambulance was called immediately at approximately 12 past 5, 13 minutes after Mr. Castigador was found by the prison guards. 
It was instructed to hospital staff that for their own safety, they had to always have Mr. Castigador in restraints with double cuffs. And he was escorted at all times by three prison officers. One hand was cuffed in front of him and the other was cuffed to a prison officer by a different set of cuffs. There were times like they had to do a CT scan when they would take the cuffs off, but it wasn't until the next day that they decided to uncuff all of him together. This was due to him being unconscious and ventilated. On March 21st, 2017, Mr. Castigador died of a stroke at the age of 62. Victor Castigador was declared dead at 10.53 a.m. due to a blood clot that had developed in an artery. Mr. Castigador had previously had to go to the hospital for similar issues back in 2012, as he was suspected of a stroke. After being looked over by doctors, Mr. Castigador was diagnosed with hypertension, a high blood pressure, and fibrillation, an abnormal or rapid heartbeat. Mr. Castigador was prescribed medication, but he refused to take it. And because of this decision, he had to be monitored by prison staff on a regular basis, all the way up until his death. On January the 5th, Mr. Castigador had to undergo a health assessment. It was reported that a healthcare professional had made a brief record of Mr. Castigador's health and made no reference to his history of a stroke or his hypertension and its fibrillation. It's also reported that the healthcare professional also did not check on his vital signs, which included his blood pressure, temperature, heart rate, and respiratory rate. Some may consider it as an injustice that he died before he was able to complete his life sentences. It was, however, reported that when it came down to the day of his funeral, no one was there to say goodbye, not even his daughter Robin, who was the only one notified of his death. The crimes committed by Victor Castigador will never be forgotten about in the UK criminal underworld. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a like and a share, and leave any thoughts or suggestions you have in the comments section. We love to read through them all. And if you're new but enjoy UK true crime content, then subscribe to see when our newest video releases. And as always, stay safe.